Welcome first-time listeners and returners to the Sports Deli, where everyone deserves a seat at the table. What about f***ing Colin? And no one's talking about that shit still. Why the f*** not? Why does he not have a f***ing job? Because he's still being white-balled. Why is Tom not speaking out about that? He should be his biggest fucking ally. And he hasn't said one fucking thing. A lot of people that have come on this show, I don't know why, they've gotten some good fucking jobs afterwards. Jim Rome in the jungle. It's right here in the sports deli, baby. We got some good ass karma right here. Let's fucking go. I love <laughs> oh, man. it. I love it. We hope you enjoy today's show, everyone. All right, let's rock and roll. I wish it was under different circumstances that we were meeting today, but. It nonetheless is as important, if not more, than any other show that we've done in the history of the Sports Deli that aligns with our mission statement of being an anti-racist equality podcast. We are here to do anything and everything to mobilize, be anti-racist, be conscious and deliberate, and a bridge to help create equitable opportunities, especially for those marginalized groups in society and in sport. And so with that being said, I'm so honored to be joined on the fourth day of Breast Cancer Awareness Month by a Hall of Famer and current head women's basketball coach at Riverside Community College, Alicia Berber. She was born the same day as Halle Berry and Magic Johnson, and the same year as, get this, Angelina Jolie, Lauren Hill, 50 Cent, A-Rod, AI, Big Poppy, Tiger Woods, and my personal favorite, Drew Barrymore from her ET days back in 1982. As a player at Riverside Community College, she earned team MVP, conference MVP, all-state laurels, Kodak All-American status, first and only in RCC history, and all-conference awards while earning her Associate of Arts degree. She continued her education and obtained a Bachelor of Arts in Social Sciences and a minor in Sociology from Washington State University where she played ball in the Pac-12. And she got an MA, a Master's in Education with an emphasis in Kinesiology from Cal State University, San Bernardino. We are also joined today by another legend, another Hall of Famer, another Riversidean, a two-time national champion, three-time National Player of the Year at USC, Olympic gold medalist, former WNBA head coach and general manager of the Phoenix Mercury, former analyst on TNT, former college basketball coach, and Title IX Virago, arguably the best women's professional basketball player in the history of the United States, Cheryl Miller. We are also joined today by the president of the Legends of the Ball, Elizabeth Galloway McQuitter, who played for the Chicago Hustle in the first ever Women's Professional Basketball League in the history of the United States, the original W, the WBL, the Women's Basketball League. I met Coach B roughly 15 years ago as a fellow California Community College head women's basketball coach, and today you will hear the rest of the story. We are convening today as a part of our 50th anniversary of Title IX Celebration Series to not only celebrate incredible pioneers, sheroes, and trailblaze hers unbelievable journeys, but to shed light on the harassment, unequal treatment, violations, and illegal activity that continues to happen with women's sports in many parts of the United States at all levels. If one lawsuit wasn't enough, Riverside Community College is involved in another lawsuit that Coach Berber filed, justifiably so in our opinion here in the Sports Deli, that alleges several violations with regards to Title IX. The first lawsuit, which was settled in August of 2013, was not the first time she endured the harassment and horrendous working conditions led by former athletic director Barry Meyer, who insisted that he be called Mr. Meyer instead of Barry, in particular by Alicia, that have affected her and her family physically, emotionally, and professionally. Again, you will soon hear how it all began with her former boss, who was found guilty and is one of the most horrendous excuses of a leader of young men and women I've ever heard of. Barry welcomed those who went along with his sexual, misogynistic, and racist hijinks and attacked those who opposed him repeatedly. Miss Berber witnessed how others were ostracized when they opposed him and how the administration did not support their efforts to assert their rights. Although she was fearful of saying anything about Mr. Meyer's conduct, she consulted with human resources and was discouraged from filing a claim of harassment against him. But she wouldn't take it anymore, and his behavior included sexual harassment, racial and ethnic discrimination, while contriving false allegations about league rules and and harassment, and at one point told Alicia, don't with me. This coming from a man who was found to have pornography 
on his school computer. She has suffered humiliation, mental anguish, anxiety, and emotional and physical distress, and has been injured in mind, body, and spirit. Alicia has suffered damage to her professional and personal reputation, suffered a loss of back pay and benefits, loss of front pay and future benefits, and additional amounts had she not been harassed, not including her house. But she's fighting back against an entire department and administration for the second time with the support of so many, including Cheryl, Elizabeth, Judy Sweet, who sends her regards, who couldn't be here today, the first female president in the history of the NCAA and a Title IX pioneer herself. Myself, Hootie Hoot, her players, her fans, her family, and so many throughout the country and around the world, as well as her attorney. Alicia, please let us take a moment to tell you how sorry we are for all that you've had to endure and your programs had to endure, the inequities that you've had to face, that you continue to fight for, that you continue to be marginalized as recently as last month. But the fight is so important and so critical to changing the culture, mindset, and laws. And the resiliency, grace, and strength that you've shown is to be admired, as many people have in the past, but not with the same type of professionalism that you've displayed. Many would have swept it under the carpet, but not you. You understand that this isn't only about Riverside and you and your family, your players and coaches, but for everyone facing injustices everywhere regarding Title IX. So with that being said, a huge warm welcome, the biggest welcome that we've ever had here. So with that being said, Cheryl's going to join us shortly, but Alicia, truly humbled and honored that you're trusting the safe space to share your story with us again, to relive parts of it, and you definitely deserve to have a seat at our table here in the Sports Deli, so welcome. Good morning. Coach. How are you? (laughs) Oh, man. I'm good. I mean, uh, the whole thing, I can't even imagine what what you've been going through. It's like literally uh, taking its toll. I I didn't sleep well, just thinking about the whole thing, just uh, emotionally. It's, uh, man, I, (laughs) Uh, yeah, it's, it's been an interesting 24 hours. For sure, since starting to read the lawsuit. Yeah, it's um, I've had some sleepless nights, to say least, but uh, I managed to get with it, so I'm good. Yeah, we're gonna talk about it, but so show everybody what shirt you're wearing because I just bought those shirts for my entire team, and everyone who was watching on YouTube just saw me wearing it during the intro. Unbelievable shirt. So it says equality in women's sports. And then we have a trademark. Yeah. And on the back, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, we deserve to be here. Yeah, sure. For those of you just listening, you can see the, sh- the team wearing the shirts. And is this the protest game? Yes, this was the protest game. And that was right after the game. Unfortunately, we lost by two points. <laughs> Didn't even feel like it that night, you know. And uh, we just kind of came together at center court and, you know, just shared a moment with each other and how important that was. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get into that a little bit later. But a huge shout out to Jim Stresser, co-founder and CEO of Cali Strong. Check them out online or go to their store here in San Diego at Seaport Village. Former owner and partner of Converse, which was eventually sold to Nike. He is about empowerment and his uh, products are unbelievable. You have to check the stuff out in the store and online. They donate every year to many, many organizations. And again, they are about empowerment and giving back. You can check them out online uh, and Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, all the social media uh, platforms. And just again, thankful that he's supporting you and Cheryl and your cause. And he has your shirts that you're talking about in his store. And check them out at cali-strong.com. And if you have any questions, send them an email to speak at cali-strong.com. All right, Elizabeth Galloway McQuitter, you are first up, batting leadoff, and why you wanted to become involved in in this particular situation? Because there's you know Title IX situations that happen all the time, but why why this one? I tip it off for us, Elizabeth. Thanks for being here. I think the one thing that I was touched by with her is that she's got a great advocate in the great Cheryl Miller, and she's yeah. she's going about it the right way to try to bring attention to it. She's maintaining her dignity while she's fighting for her players and for her cause. And um, she's not trying to harm anyone. She's not trying to embarrass anyone. She is simply asking for what the law says she 
deserves, she's earned and is mandated. The women uh, and those who are being affected or impacted by it have to do is not only become advocates for themselves, but find advocacy in every source they can, because you can't do it alone. I did connect her with the Demand 9 mm-hmm. program, you know, and that's being launched by the Women's Sports Foundation, the Billie Jean mm-hmm. King initiative, initiative, and the National Women's Law Center, and uh, Deborah Larkin. And uh, they just shine a light under the, the, the name itself, Demand More, Demand 9, just lets mm-hmm. us know that you have to continue to fight for what you should already be getting. So um, I think once once all of us align, once all of us get together, there's power in numbers. I think that's, she's on the right track. I think people need to have an understanding of what truly is going on, not only from a historical perspective, from when you had to endure these types of things, but what has still been going on with her at her alma mater, a place that she loves, which has tormented her and caused so much conflict, having to deal with this, not just for a month, not six months, not a year or two, but we're going into our second decade. And it's beyond several administrations. I think the main thing, Michael, I want to speak to mostly is that in 2022, 50 years later, it's almost like we shouldn't be discussing those same things. So that's kind of the point I want to make. It's 50 years of Title IX, June 23rd of this year. Why are we still talking about this? Yeah. uh, And that's really what I wanted to, to get at was the misogyny, the harassment, the unequal opportunities, the uh, covert and overt comments, you know, those types of things uh, happening. And so I want you to speak about that, Elizabeth, and your your sentiments about, you know, how deplorable and really inhumane those things are that she's had to endure for, like I said earlier, more than a decade. Like I, I personally, I told uh, Alicia earlier, you know, reading the lawsuit, um, the fine tooth comb, I had to put it down several times because, uh, you know, I got emotional. I, I just can't even imagine having to go through those types of things. And so as, as a woman, you're a black woman, she's a Latina woman. Both of you know better than anyone about being marginalized. And, you know, I know you both are very strong women and you have tough exteriors but I know you've been through your share of moments where you've, you know, been emotional about these types of things. And, you know, uh, I know Alicia's had to deal with this for so long that she's got a real hard exterior, but it's, uh, she was choked up the other day, you know, when we were talking on the phone and, you know, you get triggered about these types of things. And I mean, I, <laughs> anyways, uh, go, go ahead, Alicia. One of the main people that also connected me to so many people from Carolyn Peck, Candace Parker, everybody else. Um, was Annie Myers Drysdale. That's who introduced Mm -hmm. me. So between her and Cheryl and their Rolodex. (laughs) Yeah. That's those, two, those two legends, um, my gosh. And and I remember such a quick response from Carolyn Peck and her mentioning it on the national, you know, championship game. Uh, those people just like jumped on it right away and, and just started connecting me to everybody. Let me just say this before I have to jump off. And I want to make sure is that I think that campaign demand nine demand more if everybody doesn't whether it's roe b wade or whatever may be at risk in the future if everybody rests on their laurels or doesn't get involved or lets alicia go out on her own you know then if if you're next who are you going to call on you know there's 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 power in numbers she needs advocacy she needs um to get her message out and she and and I think once people see and understand what she's gone through, I think they would be able more inclined to say this could happen to me. So I think there's danger in not helping someone who is going through it. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Cheryl. What's going, little mama? What's going on? <laughs> I hate I have to jump on another one, but uh, great talking to you. I'm sure you can take it from here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, they were in great we'll hands. Soon, okay, Alicia, connect us real soon. Okay, I will. Thank you. All right, have a great okay. day. All right, you too. Bye. Bye. Hey, I was trying to snoop. Come on, guys. <laughs> That's how you get the real deal. Oh, Cheryl, how's it going? 
No complaint here. How are you doing yourself? Uh, I'm all right. I, you know, I it's it's really not about me. Obviously, I'm just trying to be a bridge. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've had nearly 35 former WNBA, ABL, WBL players on here and coaches. Um, and this is something that I, you know, really wanted to do after George Floyd and um, just be an ally in any way I can. And I've told everybody this and I continue to tell people I don't make a dime on my show. Uh, I do this because it's an important thing for my daughter to see, for uh, women to see older white men champion marginalized women and communities to understand that you have to have the courage that white privilege does exist and you have to say it and we have to come together because there are strength in numbers whether it's the WNBA changing elections um, but we don't have enough people standing up for in this case title nine issues or people that are being marginalized especially in the black and brown and the latina and latino communities and so you know i've known alicia for a long time i wish we were meeting under different circumstances um, but I'm going to do whatever I can to plaster this everywhere, as I know you are, uh, because this is too important um, to not give it the attention that it so richly deserves. And, you know, I told Alicia, Cheryl, and I don't even want to jump in here. I mean, I, I've, I'm an emotional person anyways. I just am. I'm just one of those mushy kind of guys. But, you know, reading the lawsuit and uh, talking to Alicia the other day and, you know, her tearing up in the middle of our phone call, <laughs> Like I, I told Elizabeth, I can't imagine going through a month of this, let alone two decades. And um, yeah, I was a head community college coach. You know, you played at the highest level. You're, you're tough. But there's, there's lines of demarcation in sport and in life. And mm -hmm. those were violated. And I use that word purposely. Those lines of demarcation have been violated so many times. Um, and I'll let you jump in because, you know, I know I'm going to probably get a little bit emotional with some of these things that we'll discuss today. But but go ahead and share your thoughts about, you know, this situation, your, why this is important to you and, you know, what I can do to, to be a better ally. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for giving um, us a platform, for all women, a platform. And... Uh, I'm personally involved because this is in my backyard. This is my hometown. And right. after reading, and I had to read the lawsuit because I couldn't, I wasn't even halfway through it where I wanted to throw something. Right. I wanted to smash something. And then the more I read, uh, like you said, I mean, I don't think, I don't call myself emotional and I don't call myself sensitive. I just call myself being human and what's been and what she's had to go through for two decades, not a couple of months, not a couple of years, 20 years. Are you kidding me? And I understand. I understand the thought process of white privilege. What's upsetting to me is when black men black men and I and I and I consider all minorities we're all one united should be one united minority they are probably the worst and I call them the worst because and shame on them they have daughters they have sisters they have nieces and yet what coach Berbers had to endure with the men's side of the court is appalling. And like I said, it's embarrassing. And I'm not here to call anybody out, but I guess I am, but it's shameful. But it starts at the top. Make no mistake, it starts at, it starts at the top. And this, this, what's been, what she's had to go through is systematic. Right. The, root, the roots are so deep at RCC. And I would love for somebody to come in a journalist and if they just, one pitch, did one little bit of, of a hole, you would find out the cancer and where it stems from. And it's at the top, it's the roots. And uh, no one has had the courage to endure that but Coach Berber. And when everybody else is, is saying, it's you, she's the problem. Then I start looking at everybody else and the people who, are silent 
are just as guilty as the people who are speaking up and who are ignorant and who continue the ongoing abuse. <clears throat> and I, don't, I wanna be, you know, it, it's a downer to talk about it, but we have to, but what are the solutions when, when her only avenue of, of any type of resolution is to legally go after the school, it's ridiculous. And the fact that she has already gone through one lawsuit and it never got better. I want to know why. I want names. I want them ex ex and I want them food. Period. Yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> of course we want to celebrate Title IX, but like anger should motivate you to change, to and, sh uh, and so should shame. And I, right. you know, maybe I'm all for shaming somebody because maybe by them being embarrassed, exposed, and shame, maybe that will light a fire. Yeah, like if you, we're gonna put it out there. We're gonna we're gonna post the lawsuit. We're going to in this podcast. You can pause it. So those of you that are just listening, you have to go to YouTube so that you can actually see what we're talking about. You want to come up with your formulate your own opinions. That's fine. But uh, there is documentation to back up all of these claims. And, you know, we need everyone from not just the people of color because they understand the fight better than anyone because we talk about Black Lives Matter and the fact that there are people that are staying silent because of their reputation or they don't want to get involved um, makes me want to throw up, to be quite honest with you. And even more so, you talked about white privilege, the white people in this space, and I've talked about this many times, and I, I didn't know I was going to get to it so soon, but when you talk about the Tom Brady's, even though we're talking about basketball today, we're talking about Title IX. Mm -hmm. We're talking yes. about women. Tom Brady's married. When you talk about Aaron Rodgers, when you talk about Eli Manning, Peyton Manning, the most influential white people arguably in America, besides number 45, in, and in sport for sure, and they don't say anything. And I have lost my mind on this show because I can't for the life of me understand why those guys won't use their platform to stand up for women and marginalize people and the media gives them a pass mm -hmm. and the sponsors give them a pass. And social media gives them a pass and the privilege that they experience is just mind blowing. And I, I cannot like, what is more important than standing up for our daughters and our wives and anyone that's being marginalized people of middle Eastern descent, Latino or Latinas and people of color in particular and women, of course, I, I don't understand it. And so that, that, these are the kinds of people that you need are, are the, the, the passionate people, no matter what color, what race they come from, so that we have strength in numbers across the board so that all these layers can get the message out, especially to our youth, so that we can change how we teach people so that the future generations can see this entire narrative that is so completely up still. Very much so. Differently. So sorry about that, but Alicia, go ahead and jump in. Wow. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm not the only one after reading um, my own lawsuit that, you know, going through it together, it really gets me emotional. Um, you know, there's incidents that happen to me daily um, that I can kind of tackle on a daily basis. But when you put it all together, that's where it really just, um, I kind of just like, wow. How am I still here? How am I still alive? <laughs> how, how did I survive this? You know, every day I wake up and, um, you know, I just shared with my, one of my, my classes, uh, we have 30,000 thoughts. Studies show that we have 30,000 thoughts a day. What do you choose to do with those thoughts? Negative or positive? And I came in this morning with all the people that signed the petition to get me fired. And I was throwing out good mornings. How are you doing? And I don't even think they know how. Which would have sent them 
through the roof. And and Alicia, I want you to know this because I am I was watching and I'm not going to get overly religious, but um, when you're upsetting the control freaks, the gaslighters, uh, the toxic people, then you know you're doing something right. Because, and you know that you're doing something that you're not lining up with what they think, their standards. And what really bothers me are people who know it's wrong and people who know should know better either are silent or they get involved because that it's that gang mentality because they, everybody wants to gang up on you you're the disruptor you're you know you're the toxic person you know there's something emotionally wrong with you and and i i just i encourage you to keep keep going and all you're doing is asking for what's right yeah what's right i you know i um obviously coming back to my alma mater, you know, I had goals of like any coach winning conference titles and state championships. I never thought I would be in laundromats doing my team's uniforms. I never thought I would be fighting for equal time in the gym. Um, when I was young as a coach, I was very naive. You know, I came in this, Hey, you know, I'm an all American and, you know, I, you know, I play D one ball and, you know, people are going to respect off my bio and, understand you know my goals as a coach and what I've done and what I've brought to the table and um I quickly learned um they wanted me to you know pay a price they wanted me to go to bars they wanted me to go to drinking holes the only way that you get money for your program you got to be with the old boy network and it was only till you know being young and I'm not afraid to admit this because I'm sure there's plenty of women out there that have done this is I went to the bars thinking there was this like camaraderie with coaches and, and I don't even drink. I mean, I drank in college, but I don't, I, I don't know. I became a mom and I've never, you know, really picked up a drink again. Um, and it's interesting, the narrative um, of going. And I remember my husband and my son driving away and I was pregnant with my daughter and I was headed to the bar what am I doing? And these were the exact words of the athletic director the next day. You did not show up. You will get no money for your program anymore. And I thought, wow, I am pregnant. I do not need to be in a bar. I mean, mind you, it was like, not a bar, like it was kind of like a restaurant bar kind of thing, right? Don't, I don't want anybody to get the wrong message. I'm hanging out in bars when I'm pregnant but like a restaurant and everybody was there with the intention of drinking and doing that. And I said, what, what is this? I am a professor. I am a coach. I am a mother. And what message would I be sending to my kids that I can't go home with them and, and talk about the game with my son, you know? Um, so I, as soon as that athletic director, which the one, you know, in the, in the lawsuit, Barry sure. Meyer, right. um, as soon as I did that, Oh my goodness, boy, did it just begin from, I mean, my gosh, it was just, it was so bad. And you, I mean, obviously the lawsuit tells, I mean, them trying to run me off the road to sexual harassment, to everything. And it just like, just kept coming. And, um, you mean literally try to run you off the road, literally try to yes. run me off the road, literally try to run me off the road. But of course, you're not thinking at that very moment, call the police. You know, he didn't accomplish, you know, me crashing or anything. Um, and I just, I just remember like crying and oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't believe he did this. And, and I was like in such shock. And the next day I called my attorney and he said, did you, did you call the police? And I was like, no. You should have called the cops. It would have been, you know, whatever the legal part of it. And I, I, I said, I'm not, you know, I'm not thinking about calling the police. I was just thinking like, I don't know. I was scared. This is like stuff you see in scary movies or lifetime movies or all the things you see on law and order and SVU and I, someone I, else. Yeah. Someone else. And right. I was just, and I was in shock. And then when I was on campus, 
they did the same thing. I remember them um, as I was walking, they turned the car to cut me off as I was walking and that scared me. And it just, you know, from towing my car from campus and I remember running after my car, um, just like it was yesterday, they got my car towed I was already parked in the lot. Then they put the sign on the outside. I wouldn't have been able to see that. I was actually at a volleyball game on the other side of campus. And I'm getting ready to go pick up my daughter. And she was real little. And I, I believe she was in kindergarten, first grade. So, you know, if you leave your kid there at school, a little bit later, you know, they start calling, where's the parents? So I'm panicking. I'm literally running after my car and the tow truck. And I remember an RCC police officer come right up next to me and said, coach, I'm sorry we did it because administration told us we had to get in the car. I'm going to take you to the tow truck uh, service. He drove me up to the tow truck service. The tow truck company said, coach, we know who you are for formality's sake. Give us whatever you have. I had like 60 bucks, 70 bucks, something like that. You know, they didn't even charge me what you normally would charge, you know, like, what is of it, $100, $200 to get out of the, to get out, get your car out. And um, so the they, fuck? they literally took it right off the truck and gave it to me and said, we're reading the papers. Don't worry about it. We love what you're doing. And I went to go get my daughter. And I remember just, you know, just being so emotional. I, I just couldn't believe that nobody was stopping them from doing these things and you're saying this stemmed because of that one night in the bar where you did not comply with what they perceived to be uh one of the taking one for the team yep i had to be part of the team i had to the do entire what they what they did and and as a young coach i'm not as ashamed to say that like i went along and uh i well, went hung out what yeah. other option would you have had i was Honestly. 25 years old when i became a head coach I don't like know what other 25 year old in a position like that, um, Alicia, they would have done the same thing. I would have done the same thing. Right. And, and the fact that you were a mom and a total disregard of the AD and everyone else. And like I said, you know, I, I would love to sit up here and the profanity is, is boiling up in my head, but I'm not going to allow myself to go there. But there's a lot of people are going to have to give an account. Yep for what they've not only said and done, or why didn't they step up? So the, the four areas, Coach, and you you take it down whatever road you want to take it down, because I know Cheryl's time's limited, and when you got to go, Cheryl, it's no no problem at all, obviously. But No, it's just, it's now, it's now good and good. It's oh, yeah. It's okay. good and good. Right. I may stay for a little longer, but it's good and good. Yeah, so the, the four areas, so the sexual discrimination, the yeah. preventative component of all of this, right? the district doing everything they could have to uh, put laws, rules, regulations in compliance with Title IX, working towards equitable opportunities. Um, that's the second second issue, the retaliatory, the retaliation part, and then the failure to prevent retaliation. So those are four things. Now, ladies and gentlemen, whether you're listening or watching, th this is just the beginning of what is over a hundred different bulleted items, numbered items in this lawsuit that details exactly what Alicia and her players and her coaches had to endure and her family, her husband, her kids had to endure uh, over not like we said earlier, a month or a few months or a one-time incident that was a misunderstanding, but going into our second decade now. So what, what areas do you want to tackle? So I'll tell you real quick, Alicia, I told you I had a lawyer look at this. And the three areas that stood out to him when he messaged me last night were the wheelchair, the wheelchair knee brace story, which that was one of the times I had to put it down. I literally like Cheryl, I thought I was going to throw my phone through the wall. I know, I know. Like, the God I know the damn it. How dare you touch someone's leg? Right. And just the principle of the whole thing, mm -hmm. like that you don't trust somebody that they're in compliance, which the, the whole compliance issue for that situation was so ridiculous to begin with. The, the other thing, obviously, with the weight room, which, you know, may trigger a lot of people because of what we remember about the NCAA tournament a couple of years ago and how right. up that shit 
is without equitable mm -hmm. opportunities for women. And then obviously the massive difference in salaries, which people can probably wrap their head around that one more, but give people an idea of how much of, and I said this earlier, of a complete violation, not only to have somebody come and embarrass you in front of your team, but to touch you and then backhandedly say things on their way out of the gym about how you're being monitored this semester. You know, you're being evaluated, those types of things that are just beyond Threats. inappropriate Threats. And, and illegal. Well, um, the sad thing about that wheelchair incident and with the other athletic director that came in is I guess that passed, Derek. The, statu that passed the statute of limitations. Right, because we had just said settled... that was Derek, right? That was Derek. Yeah, Derek Johnson. Who yeah, make sure we let, let everyone know who he was too. Yep, and he's currently um, he moved away, got another job. Then he currently is in the community system again. He's at college, his land everywhere. Um, but with the um, with the wheelchair incident, I'll just go by the incidents um, because they're yeah. so ingrained in my head. I mean, obviously, I've lived. So them. sorry. Um, the the most horrible thing um my my doctor i mean i've had 13 surgeries on my body anybody that anybody that's played sports and that and puts it all out there i i mean i've i've had so many surgeries i mean i know exactly i could probably be my own anesthesiologist that's how well i know how surgery works but um and the, you're, you're not you're not just some run-of-the-mill you know, Cheryl obviously understands this as a, a three-time national player of the year, you know, Olympic champion, you know, somebody who was fighting for title nine in, you know, in discrimination in a whole different way in the eighties, but you played D one basketball at Washington state. Like you're not some like chump who doesn't understand, like you coach softball and all of a sudden you're coaching basketball now, just because they needed someone to fill the position. Like you acutely understand the nuances to women's intercollegiate athletics and women's sports and women. So people need to understand this. This, this, this isn't just anyone. So sorry to interject, but go ahead and continue. No, not a, that's fine. Um, you know, and the thing with the, the wheelchair incident is because it stemmed from Barry Meyer again. So not only did I have a current lawsuit, he said that I was faking a knee injury after I had um orthoscopic surgery he said i was faking it um last time i checked i don't think anybody wants to be on a surgical table um so they actually monitored me like you see on television they had video of me eating at chipotle with my daughter they had me going to the nail salon with my little girl getting her little paint nails painted i couldn't believe people were videotaping me and they were that close to me they were in the parking lot hiding in cars going through all of this and then it got to an accommodations meeting at the district. And that day they pulled me out of practice. And Derek Johnson said, you need to get to the district right now. You have an accommodations meeting. If you're not here, this can cause termination. And of course, naive me, I'm nervous about it. And I had, not only did I have my um, lawyer for the civil part of the case or the employment case, I had my workers comp lawyer and so I, I went in there without my lawyer. I sat down in good faith. I was like, well, what would they possibly do to me? They're, I didn't do anything wrong. If my knees hurt. Well, they but, kept but, but Alicia, hold on a second. I was a head community college coach also. And I know you're unionized. Uh -huh. And so that's the other part of it is that you didn't have union representation there either to make sure that you, you were legally being advised and represented in that meeting as well. So that should be noted. Well, the is a whole different special entity. I, right. I'm so disappointed in that. It's it, yeah. it, That makes me want to throw up. But so I go into this meeting in good faith and they said, you know, we have your doctor's orders and you're supposed to be wearing your knee brace when you're uh, coaching. And I said, well, I have, my doctor said, you know, as needed um rest in peace dr wall but dr wall i think did surgery on cheryl as well he did he was a very uh well-known orthopedic surgeon and he would always joke with me about hey if you want to get on that court you're going to be that old lady going from three-point line to three-point line no more banging bodies and he wanted me up walking and moving but there was times he said you know sit down and practice whatever he gave me whatever i needed to do they said that 
Dr. Wall did not call them or not respond to them. So since he's not responding and they don't know my work restrictions, which they did know my work restrictions because I turned those in, that I will have to coach from a wheelchair. And I said, what? But I don't need a wheelchair. So they, and I said, well, okay, fine. In the sport of it, you want to stick me in a wheelchair? Give At least give me an electric wheelchair. No, nope. <laughs> they, they, they stuck me in the most horrendous and I'm not a small lady. Oh. I'm a big lady. I'm 5'10". I'm, I'm a big lady. So they give me, first of all, the wheelchair gentleman comes in and he delivers it to my office and he goes, oh, I'm here to deliver the wheelchair. Who is this for? And I said, it's for me. He goes, what? Why do you need a wheelchair? And I said, exactly. I go, I don't need a wheelchair. My uh, college is just being about it. So I got a coach out of a wheelchair and he just said, I wish you the best, but here's your wheelchair. So the directive from the risk manager, his name was um, Michael Simmons. Mm -hmm. And um, the directive was when I got to work that I would walk to my office, sit in the wheelchair, coach from the wheelchair, and then leave the wheelchair in my office and walk back to my car. Well, that was the most horrifying thing to be a part of because so many students wanted to help me. Coach, let me help you in the restroom. Coach, let me push you. And I'm like, and I had to tell him like, no, 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 I'm okay. There's nothing wrong with me. Then why are you in a wheelchair, coach? It's long story, but I'm just gonna roll with it. And I remember coaching and you know me, or how I coach, I'm up and down the sidelines. And so I'm wheeling back and forth, almost cutting my fingers off in the wheels, going back and forth, trying to coach my team. And I remember out of one of my practices, my team came up to me and they said, coach, you're a superwoman. We're going to hook that wheelchair up with stickers and everything, <laughs> everything else. But shortly after that, the president, Dr. Cynthia Azari walked in the gym and she said, what are you doing in a wheelchair? And I said, why don't you ask your risk manager that? And she says, until I find out, just do me a favor, come to my office in the wheelchair. <laughs> so I had to go to the top of campus in a wheelchair. And when I got in her office, she told me, get out of the wheelchair now. I talked to Simmons, you are not coaching from a wheelchair. Unbelievable. And so I shared that with my attorney, but at that time we had just settled the other case. So, you know, we were still documenting, like, after we settled, these are the kind of things they did. And, uh, yeah, that was that was gut-wrenching to be in a wheelchair for over a week coaching my team. And, I mean, maybe I should have put a suit that the women's bathroom wasn't accessible because I almost went forward. Oh, my face. Right? Uh, so, at crazy. one point, I know you, I, want, I want you to share with everyone another story about the, the knee brace. But at one point you had to cover up your office with oh, yes. with paper because you didn't trust. And you, you know, you would think when I read that, I'm thinking to myself, damn, as a male coach of women, I would never cover up the office. Shit, you know what they're probably thinking. And yeah, you sure had to, you had to actually do the opposite because of what you were afraid of. And so that's another story where someone in particular literally came in violated your space again and and took that down even though you were not in violation of district policy of privacy in your own office yeah and it, it was it was the athletic director um at the right. time Derek johnson he right. came in and um every administrator that came in and knew my situation it was almost like they were who's gonna beat me or who's gonna handle me and he came in and he said um you know, I'm new here, you know, whatever. I said, I understand that you need to take the paper off your window. And I said, no, I don't. If you walk around campus, there's professors all over the place that have, you know, political cartoons on their windows, whatever they, don't, they have their windows covered. Right. And he didn't care. And he continued to rip the paper right off my window. And then I did call the union on that. And the union sent an email right away and gave him the directive that that's not a policy. And then he had to apologize for that. And then, then he continued his behavior by coming into my um, practice and he just wanted to see if I had my knee brace on. Well, I had my, my coaching pants on and he kept saying, well, let me see. And I'm on the sidelines coaching my team. And he said, well, let me see. And I started zipping up my pant leg and then he 
if you want to call it, assisted me and started pulling my pant leg up on one side. I said, I got it. He goes, what about the I'd other? Dro- I'm sorry. I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I'd have dropped. See, I am so sick and tired of Black men being the first people with their hands up, you know, during Black History Month and how we, you know, Black Lives Matter, all those things. And that's, and that's great and that's wonderful. But there's that percentage of Black men that do these things, they are so gutless. And I'm calling them out because as a Black man, you are supposed to sit up there and, and cover and cover us, especially as a minority, because God forbid something, you know, they're discriminated against. So the first ones to sit up there and call foul. First ones to hold their hands up, but they're not the first people to put their best foot forward to help out. And they complicate things. That's what throw, that blows my mind. They complicate the issue. I know you're not talking about all black men, but I, I understand what you're saying. No. But this isn't so, complicated. It's just common sense. And you're coming in. If I'm a black man, black female coming into a toxic, a toxic environment, which she is from top to bottom, toxic, and you're coming in as a newbie, fresh eyes, and all, all of a sudden, within two, three months, right. you have formed a, an opinion about people in a situation. What the is wrong with you? But yet, you want, that's why I can't do anything for real. I can't do anything. The, t- the two big of hip- uh, hypocrites, and they always want their hands out. And until until our s- gets correct, I'm just simply saying, s- side, I'm I'm through. I'm done with them. We're in 2022. 2022, and you still have people, our coaches, her colleagues, with name calling, with profanity lace, you know, diatribe, all this stuff, and and and. And no one's being held accountable but Coach Berber. She's the problem. She has issues. And all the on your campus or your campus who want to tag on to that and co-sign to that, shame on you too. Because if it can happen to her, you're next in line. Guarantee you that. All you wonders at RCC, you're next. Yeah, that silence definitely has been deafening. So, Coach, there's a lot of stories, like I said, in that lawsuit from um, mentioning of your breasts to um, specific parts of your breasts yeah, to other things. And so we want to give people an idea of the, the list of things. They're going to see it. They're going to visually see it. Mm-hmm. But give people an idea for those that are just listening and, and not watching on YouTube, you know, some, some of these things that were actually said that it's not funny. I just, well, no, you know what? It, it is almost so crazy. It's almost, sometimes I have conversations with people. It's laughable. And I know that it's not laughable. Like they're laughing at me. It's everybody's just so appalled by the these absurdity. Things. Yeah. And I was, I was always afraid to speak up, to share these things, but not anymore. Um, and I'll, I'll get to the reason of why not anymore. But, you know, that whole incident with... Um, That's your slogan, about, Coach. What's that? Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> See how it organically like just that. happened? There you go. Not, not anymore. anymore. And it's true, not anymore. Um, and I, I think the thing with the, with the incident, we were at an athletic event, and um, it was the end of the year, um, Coach of the Year celebration. And I remember I was in the kitchen area and Barry Meyer's wife was bringing out the desserts and it would happen to be a tray of brownies. And I was wearing a white shirt with jean shorts. And the reason I know my, my attire, because usually my attire ends up being RCC clothes or Ramona right. high school clothes that my kids go to that school. Um, and in front of my other, um, in front of the other coaches, one of them being Steve Ziglock, the department chair that I currently work with. Um, and he says, hey, Alicia, I can see your nipples through that shirt. They look just like those brownies right there. And I remember just freaking what out. A you just freaking a out. And just, just kind of doing the, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Ha ha. Walk out. Leave. Um, and then later on, when that was investigated with the district, 
they deemed him not liable for those comments because he was honest and admitted to doing that in the lawsuit. And is there a statute of limitations with that? I I don't I don't know. I don't know. I don't know because in that that was in the first lawsuit and because the lawsuit was settled. I don't know. I don't know. And I, I just um, you know, after our protest game in February, the support that we received, um, I could not believe the rest of the community college coaches that were just sharing their stories. Alicia, we're so afraid of what administration would do to us for what you stood up for, but we're here. We're wearing the shirts with you. We want you to know we're with you. Sorry. You're good, take your time. It's just become a bigger mission for all the women's coaches at the California Community College level because there's so many stories of really close friends. And a lot of them are part-time too, right? So they yes. they could not be offered an assignment in a in a quick minute. And yes. they can just say, well, we'll just assign you a health class instead of the basketball class. And and no one would know the difference because they're part-time. That's the part that people don't understand. It's not the tenured people like you. It's the part-timers that could lose their job because of, they speak out. Well, when I won that first lawsuit. You were part-time. I was part-time. Right. And Steve Ziglock, our department chair, minimized my classes. They just, you know, they just didn't give me right assignment. Is it legal for him to do that? Absolutely. But it was a way for him to, it just took away my livelihood. And I actually lost my home. I couldn't afford to stay in there anymore because it just changed how I lived. Um, what the f Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of things that, you know, whoever's listening to this, there's a lot of things that people don't know that may not even be, you know, in that lawsuit, um, you know, because you, you can't say, oh, well, he's responsible for me losing my house. Well, they are responsible because they indirectly took away my classes and my right of assignment as a part-timer. So they did. They were a cause of it because I was fine before. But that's okay. I, I, I well, I mean, the reason no, I became... Okay. It's, the re it's, it's the reason okay. I became full time after all those years is because I was under an illegal professional expert contract at the district, and four other gentlemen, four other coaches benefited from that because they had to make it right. So you're talking about that there wasn't enough full time faculty in terms of ratios. Well, what they what they did the reason the only reason I became full time is because they had an illegal, they were doing illegal professional expert contracts. And so these illegal professional expert contracts were just so arbitrarily done, right? Um, there was no step increases. Um, they would say, hey, your salary is 30,000 and we'll give you medical benefits. We're gonna give uh, another person $100,000 and you're not gonna have medical benefits. So they just did whatever they wanted to do. And so because I spoke up about that, I became tenured faculty in 2017. 17, yeah. After being in the district since 1999. Um, and I became full time just out of the fact that they were doing illegal things with the contracts. Thanks for so, being so transparent, Coach. Sorry about everything. I can't, I still can't. Um, but people need to know this, you know, as long as you, you know, continue to have the strength to share each of these situations you know and shout out to all the coaches who came and and supported you i don't know if you want to you know oh. let, let everyone know some of who those people were because i know a lot of those coaches especially in the community college ranks yeah i mean absolutely the orange empire conference coaches the women's coaches they were mm -hmm. here with their teams mm -hmm. um they shared stories uh marcia who was at fullerton yeah he says we had great talks over dinner we had great talks in the van to and from because the young ladies didn't know really what Title IX was or what it was about and what we were fighting for. And, um, you know, from Flo Lupani and Margaret Moore and, and Bakersfield coach Paula Dahl. Mm. Um, Paula's phenomenal. They were, they were just, everybody was just buying these shirts and they were in support. But I, I think the biggest message was all the support that came in all the young ladies that didn't really understand what title nine was and that's where i said oh my gosh 
we are going to make this grow. We are going to teach these young women about Title IX. And that's how the preparation for the Title IX celebration came about. And I said, I'm not going to make this negative. I am going to make it a positive. We are going to make a Title IX celebration. And it's not going to be a protest game where the players are blocking the doors and we're not going to make it ugly. We're going to make it positive. And I even thought to myself, because a couple of friends of mine had said, wow, if you do that event at RCC, that's really going to put a good light on them. And they don't even deserve that. And I said, I don't care because it's not about RCC. It's going to be about bringing our youth in the community here and letting them understand like the good of Title IX, not people that are breaking the law of Title IX, but the good of Title IX. And maybe one day, one of those little girls will go through something at work and remember, you know, that celebration. Cheryl, speak on that in terms of how many people you've influenced over the years and and how now after basketball, that's probably the most important thing you've coached in the WNBA. You know, you've, you've done it all. You've seen it all. Your brother's done it all and seen it all. Um, But what, what's the most important thing to you in your life now as a black woman? Well, I would really love to say that I've seen it all and done it all. But after talking to uh, to Coach Berber, no, I haven't. And I, I mean, and I'm 58. And in my opinion, it's gotten worse. It's gotten worse. And our society is worse. There is not, there's entitlement. I'm entitled now to voice my opinions. I no longer need to hide, you know, behind, uh, my racism. I could put my hand up, say, yeah, I don't like black people. I don't like minorities, Um, you know, affirmative action we need to get rid of. You know, people now feel that they have a voice and you always have a voice and you can say whatever you say, but it has, it should have consequences. And that's what I find appalling right now where we're at 2022. There is a lack of sensitivity. There is a lack of humanity. There is a lack of goodness, kindness. Um, it's gone. It's, it, it's, I, I won't say it's completely gone. It is missing because it's all about me. It is all about me, what I can get. And that's, and that's why um, I applaud Alicia for standing up and showing her players the right way to do things on and off the court. If you look at her record, for, forget, you know, the wins and, and you know, the titles and or whatever she's won. Look at her record, her academic record with her kids, graduation rates. You know, it's not two years in and two years out, in and out. It's not like that because kids still come back and have, you know, hey, coach, I, I'm doing this. Thank you so much. You know what? When you kicked me out the gym, the light bulb went on. I understood that. I understood what you were trying to say, you know, and that's, that's a true coach and see is missing it. They have missed the mark and I'm all for someone coming in independent, fresh eyes and up that college. It needs to. Well, I'm doing it with such grace. I mean, there's no way you or I would have kept our mouths shut the way that she has and gone about it Absolutely. from this perspective. I, I, there's just no way <laughs> I had lost my mind. Well, I, I, I'm telling you 10 years ago, if she would, if I would have known what was going on, I would have gone down there and somebody put my on somebody because it's ridiculous. That's probably why I don't have a job right now. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking about that. But I'm just simply saying, come on, folks, let's bring back the humanity. And also with Title IX, and I want to make this perfectly clear, it's not about male bashing. Right is right. Equal should be equal. We're not trying to bash men. We need men to teach their daughters, their nieces, what they should want what they what they are entitled to the right things to be entitled to and and we need your help we need the men to help us to help us grow this movement and the ones that don't want to be a part of it kick rocks and get out of the way 
go kick rocks and get out of our way. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, when, um, trust me, I have my moments when I'm sitting in the car and I see somebody walk by <laughs> and I'm sure I have a few choice words, uh, you know, to share that are probably not nice. Punk, punk ass. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's but a I, good I one. Just, I can't, I can't. Merry Christmas. <laughs> hey, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. Uh, I just um God I, I think about you know um the humility and you know I think I don't know I, I sometimes I share this with Cheryl man I wish I was just a a mean person sometimes because of what they do but I want once for sure you know I'm, this is my alma mater you know I I love RCC for how they helped me academically and my coach and what he did for me. And, and I respect that. And it's not easy to try to like, um, put RCC in a bad light. And I even, I even like beg administrators, like, just help me. I don't want this to be all in the media. Just help me, help me fix this. Let's do this the right way. This was my school. And it's not just about you. It's about from now until the next 50 years for exactly. young girls and women to have equal access and equal opportunities. That's what it's really about. That's what the fight's about. Yeah. And I, I, I just, I, I, I think they're waiting for me to blow up. I mean, some of the things that they do in the hallways by, you know, still. Oh yeah. This just happened uh, this past spring when um, a track coach um, just in the hallway said, F you, Alicia. And that was still being investigated. And I don't know what came about it, but I said good morning to him this morning. Just keep on moving. I mean, you know I, uh, and, kill him with kindness. I mean, I, I, out, I, let's call yeah. up. Let's call up. Yep. Because they're sitting on their hands. They're not doing anything either. And you know what? If you're not going to be part of of the solution, and and the problems. That you're you're not just the only case. You, this this is happening everywhere, and the is doing nothing. Well, and the athletic director told you not to fuck with them, also at one point. Yep. And there was another incident where someone cussed at you. Tell us about that one. Oh, it was uh, my counterpart that I work with right now called me a pariah of athletics and stop effing with people's livelihood. That one hurt. That one hurt. That's a gaslight if I've ever heard a gaslight. You're literally no the about you're it. literally the opposite. You're you're literally an ally and an advocate for those being marginalized and for people that are covertly and overtly saying things that are not true. Like that's literally the opposite. Man, that is <laughs> Well, you're, you're now aware of things in a space that you probably never were aware of before, uh, unfortunately, uh, but now you can be an even bigger ally. And I know you have some amazing young women on your team, you know, yes. who are, are, are strong young women as well, leaders, and they're seeing this right before their very eyes. They're not reading it in a textbook. Yeah. And they, you know, these young women, and, and you know this from, from coaching at the community college level, each year is so different, different dynamic. You might lose one or two players because they just have to get two or three jobs to support their family because we don't give scholarships at the California Community College. And I think it just shows like they're invested in what we're doing. I have all eight of my freshmen back mm. and I haven't had that in the 23 years that I've been here. And that just shows their level of commitment. They're great young ladies. Um, and I'll just say this on this podcast because I mean, obviously nobody here cares about it we had the highest gpa um in the fall last year of a 3.66 for my team mm. and then overall we were the highest gpa for all men and women's sports here at the college of 3.33 and nobody recognizes them at the college for that um young ladies will get emails about you know dean's list and individual honors but i think it should just be blasted all over the college emails about what an accomplishment and this is you know, um, as co-equity student chair, we talk about, you know, making things better and breaking down barriers. 
and we're not even celebrating um, the the young black black and African American women, Latina women that are on my team, Asian American women that are getting 4.0s that are that are taking English and math here at the college and they're not taking them at some extension center just to get a grade to be eligible. Like they are doing the work. And like the players, them. right? Like the players who had classes that were made up out of nowhere just so that they could get credits. Yep. Yep. All hmm. over. Unbelievable. Coach, any other stories, Cheryl, anything else? The, the only thing that, that I have to do right now Oh, first of all, thank you for having me on. Um, but now I have to go pray. I have to go ask for forgiveness for what I'm thinking and may say, and hopefully won't do. But um, for for everyone, please, please do yourself a favor. Is read the lawsuit, not to get angry, but to draw some wisdom from it, and and approach this in a different way that uh, in a way that it benefits you it drops the knowledge here and you can see it when it's coming and you won't be blindsided because if you give people enough rope, they'll hang themselves. Well, yes. And the reality is that um, the, the only thing that people hate and are afraid of more than lawsuits is social media. So I don't care about numbers or monetarily anything. I care about people that I love and care about and who have a message that needs to get out to the masses and so we need everyone to share this, forward it, like it, comment about it, uh, let everyone know about it uh, so that everyone understands that this stuff is going on um, in California, uh, which is even crazier to me, uh, at a community college where we're supposed to be a bridge you know, to help people be a better version of themselves so they can get to a USC you know, or a Cal or U UCLA or you know, those types of schools. So the grace that you've approached all of this with coach, and we'll talk about a couple other things before Cheryl gets off here, but Cheryl, thank you so much, much love to My you pleasure. and we'll, we'll, we'll talk soon. I'll be in touch. All right, partner. Appreciate you. Yeah. No worries. All right, ladies and gentlemen, look at that. She had a title nine shirt on. Did you guys see that right at the end? She had, she had the LGBTQ title nine shirt on. <laughs> we got a yeah. glimpse of that right at the end. Yep, yeah, that's uh the the Naismith Hall of Fame. She actually uh, oh. I have a, a a poster of that that the Hall of Fame gave us. Which oh my God, is that is that t-shirt? Yeah, is that t-shirt for public consumption? I got to get that t-shirt. Oh my yeah. God, that is phenomenal. Yeah, it's it's a wow. really cool um, poster, and the Naismith Hall of Fame actually allowed us to use their logo for our event on October fifteenth. Wow. Um. Mm. And uh, we're really excited about that, that event. So tell everybody about that and the, the lunacy <laughs> about why, and, and also the, the good part of why it's at Ramona and not at RCC. Another well, example. So basically what had happened last year, like I said, in February, we had the protest game. And I know everybody was a little nervous about that. Um, the president at the time wanted to censor what we were going to say um to the media and that was halted and we were able to have media here in february for that protest game and there were so many people within a week's time buy the shirt that i'm wearing right now and they wore these shirts just in unity and um and it was just a great showing and i i couldn't believe when you know you know people are blocking doors from people from coming in i mean you just feel like you're in like an old movie back in the day when they do stuff like that in the 60s um, yeah and they and they literally you know try to say oh it's due to covid it's like come on if it's due to covid then why do you have everybody smashed in the stands you would have had them spaced out everywhere it was just <laughs> but after the huge support i thought gosh you know we could really get people to understand what title nine is in a very positive way so we had scheduled a event in january um for the next year and we were going to do a game or we were going to do a game um, to celebrate, like we were going to do a game with the women's professional Drew League. And due to COVID, I didn't want any more of the nonsense and we can't let many people in. So I said, okay, right. let's hold off on this. So I, I talked to Tanisha Ware Daniels, which is, she is the um, commissioner for the women's uh, professional Drew League. And she said, um, yeah, that would be great. We will get the ladies there to play a game. 
and they are former WNBA players, Division I players, and overseas players. I said, this is going to be great. So we decided on a date. I looked at the schedule. The men's schedule last year, they had a scrimmage on October 19th and the 23rd. The RRCC men had. So I said, great. The 15th is open in that time because, you know, if you're coaching, usually every, everybody follows along the same schedule. And then it was great for her, uh, Tanisha, in the Drew League, because they would be into their season. So then she would have all the teams established. And then the 15th was also a good kickoff to our season in November. So it was just a perfect date. So we came up with this date and we've been planning it for, you know, over a year. And then come to find out um, the men's team scheduled a scrimmage. But ultimately, um, if anybody understands this, the athletic director can say, hey, hold on. Um, the women are going to do their Title IX event. And the response was, well, I thought your game was going to be at six o'clock. And I said, well, this is not just a game. This is like an event, which the college and you and everybody else should be helping me. And nothing should be happening in the gym on that day. And, um, and then they just kept holding off and, and um, making it harder to plan. So then um I mean, they just couldn't make a decision. Were they going to make the men's team move? Were they going to reschedule a scrimmage? And the scrimmage is just, it's not even a sports scrimmage. It's not even, fans are not even welcome in a scrimmage. It's just- No score. Teams, no score, no record, nothing. So anyways, we literally um, just said, enough's enough. And I teamed up with Ramona High School. Um, that's where my kids went to school. The athletic director there, John Tibbles, awesome man all about women and sports, all about men and sport. I mean, he's just an awesome athletic director. So the huge shout out to him. Right. If anybody sees this nationally, what an incredible human being. Um, he's uh, so helpful. I don't think he gets enough credit for what he does in this community. Um, and he really just stepped up and said, yeah, sure. Let's team up with our girls basketball team. Wow. And so the Ramona girls basketball team and myself, we're going to put a clinic together oh. that starts at one o'clock and Cheryl's going to be there. Even though she's retired from coaching, we're going to get her back in there coaching these kids. And then, you know, we're going to have a Drew League game at 4 p.m. Wow. And, I mean, we got great support. We have, um, you know, Norman Pell and his foundation, Understanding the Ground uh, Grind Foundation. Mm -hmm. Kelly Sports, um, based out of San Diego, um, supporting us, actually selling our shirt in their store. So that is absolutely amazing. And just uh, demand uh, travel ball that's in our community that does a really good job as well. Um, just a lot of people are supporting this and mm. the support just keeps coming in. So these final two weeks, it's going to be fun to see what we can come up with on October 15th. Man, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, so as far as the lawsuit goes, you know, there's a lot of pages. But just I for transparency's sake, and obviously, you know, it doesn't feel good when I'm naming people, but um feels good to me yeah they 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 put themselves in that situation to be honest with you I think a lot of people have this misconception um that I was the one that got rid of the athletic director I mean he did it to himself they found you mm -hmm. know not so nice stuff if you if you read the article that Howard Megdell the journalist for the WNBA if you read his article you can read more about what they found on his computer so Anybody knows that if you go from an athletic director and you're a, a professor, they just throw you right back in the classroom. Well, so I'll say it, coach, if you don't want to say it, they found pornography on his computer. Yeah. So that's, you know, obviously something that was admissible in some way and a reason yeah. for his departure. Yeah. And that was that was listed in the um, in the uh, articles and mm -hmm. and and, 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 you know, and as far as, you know, my current department chair that I named, he um it's somebody that my team put in that open letter in the quality and women's sports uh, Instagram is it's um, it's not a personal thing with any of these people. They made it very personal right. because when I had a situation with the athletic director, um, they all decided to sign a petition against me to get me fired. All of my colleagues that I current work with. And um, it's very unfortunate, but I know my attorney's perspective was, okay, well, they want to get involved now. Now they're all named in the lawsuit. So they put themselves in that situation. And I, I don't have any personal um, 
believe it or not, bad feelings towards them. I just think they they have their own things they have to deal with. I, I don't wish bad upon anybody or any of these people. Um, I can only control, you know, what I do. And um, it never feels good to, to, I guess, put somebody on blast because I know they have families. It was very difficult for me to even put a lawsuit out there against the former athletic director, Barry Meyer, um, because I know his wife and I know his kids. That was so hard for me to do, even after all the stuff he did to me. Yeah. Um, did anyone since you got there, since the first lawsuit, uh, have a change of heart and say, I really... I've really blown it and I'm sorry. And, uh, I can't stay silent anymore. Um, well, their silence is still there, but one of the secretaries, um, called me on the phone one day and I saw her name on there and I said, hello. And she said, I just want to apologize. Cause I know that we were making stuff up and I found a different route in my life. And I'm trying to make things right. And I just told her, thank you. I appreciate that. And I just remember getting off the phone and crying. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you always have a little bit of self-doubt. Man, am I really that bad or am I the problem? And then when she called and said, we, we made things up and I'm really sorry because I know that's not who you are. Nobody will ever get to see that in the papers. Nobody will ever get to see that apology. Um, and I appreciate it. Um, but she did that. Um, no, there's not anybody that's apologized. Um, nobody's, nobody's ever apologized. At least, at least me personally to me, um, I know one of the most horrifying things that they did to me, I, I really pride myself in following the guidelines of the three C2A. And they said I was uh, cheating um, with, a, you know, the non-traditional season that we play, yeah. that I had people in the class and they weren't supposed to be in there. And they thought they really got me. And what it was, it was a young lady who her license had one name, but she didn't change it in the college system. It was the same young lady. So they thought they had me. And so they went and turned that into the commissioner. The commissioner didn't even question it. And they put me on probation and they blasted it in the newspaper. And I remember being, mm. this happened at um, Kaiser Hospital. My good friend was delivering her baby. I was there for the whole family and I was delivering McDonald's and everything else you do when you're in the lobby waiting for that baby <laughs> to be born. Right. And everything was great. And I went to my car to go grab something. And when I came back, the whole family was just really quiet. And I thought, oh gosh, did something happen to the baby? Like what's going on? And I remember her cousin saying, Alicia, did you see the newspaper? And I said, no. And he showed it to me and my face was on there. Coach has been put on probation for illegal, you know, you know, whatever, um, whatever thing that they put me under. And I just was like, oh my gosh. You know, I was, I was like, this isn't true. They're like, Alicia, we know it's not true. We just wondered if you even saw this. So of course I called my attorney and they retracted it in the newspaper. That was part of, you know, their, their job when we settled, but you guys just plastered my face and said that I was under probation and I didn't do anything wrong. So that's what gives me a little bit more of the courage and strength to talk now is like, nobody's listening. I've asked nicely. I've said, you know, just just please help me change this. This is not, these things are not right. And um, they just, I don't know, they sell their soul to win. They they rather win and not pay attention to what's going on with the teams. And I, again, I don't want to bring negativity towards the athletics teams that here at RCC, because at the end of the day, it's not the student athletes, right. it's their coaches. The student athletes I love the student athletes. I have conversations with the student athletes. I have conversations where, hey, coach, I I wish I was a woman on your team because you hook <laughs> up the girls, you take care of them. Um, 
so I, I, I don't wish that bad upon any of, you know, the student athletes. That's not my intention. That's not my goal. Well, it's inevitable that you're going to have a, a somewhat of a bad taste in your mouth at your alma mater where you're in the Hall of Fame. And it's just a, it's a sad dichotomy. There's a duality to this that um, nobody should ever have to go through. And the grace that you've handled yourself with is uh, unparalleled. I just don't know anyone that has handled, I've seen people handle things with grace, but not remain at the place that they've had so much difficulty with that's tormented them, that has scarred them, you know, that has violated them. And for you to still hold your head high and say good morning to people <laughs> and, and truly be about the kids and, and, and be on that committee, you know, that that's helping people better understand how to, how to be, be the best versions of themselves every day and understand that they have a voice is just is just remarkable and that's a big reason why we do this show is to put people uh and their stories to shed a light and so i applaud you you know i mean i loved you as a coach you know you're always a fireball and you know you always kicked my ass when i was at mesa <laughs> and i had my share of issues at mesa that we could talk about it on another day but um you know this seems pretty clear cut to me you know, I know you can't talk about some of the uh, things going on behind closed doors, but, um, you know, we wish you the best of luck, you know, in, in your healing journey, you know, not just in the basketball journey and the legal journey and um, props to you for what you've done and how you've handled all of this. It's just uh, like I told Cheryl and you earlier, there's no way I could have handled it this way. I, I just, there's no way. <laughs> I, I mean, I would have spoken out like you. There's a lot of things I would have done like you, but I, there is no, no way. I couldn't have kept my mouth closed. Well, there's a, you know, it's, uh, I think I have a strength to, obviously there's California community college coaches um, like yourself. You're, I mean, look what you're doing for us and putting this, all of us on this platform. I mean, I can go, the list goes on with, um, you know, the gentleman at El Camino, Steve Shaw, mm -hmm. uh, one of my heroes, Napa Valley, Paul DeBolt. I mean, these wow. guys are are in the trenches with us and they are supporting women um, and they're just absolutely amazing. Um, and it, if it weren't for me, you know, growing up through the ranks of community college and having that support, um, and I'm just going to say this, and they know who they are when I call them the wolf pack. We have this wolf pack of, of uh, female coaches who, you know, we really um, want to do things the right way. And we want to, you know. I got a feeling Flo is in that group somewhere. Yeah, somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Man, you know, uh, we want to, we want to do, we want to do things the right way. Mm -hmm. And then when the younger coaches come up, we want, we want to, we want to teach them, Hey, this is, right. this is a lot bigger beyond the court. You know, these, these young women are going to be people in our community. They're going to be our leaders and let's, let's teach them the ranks. Let's teach them how they can better themselves and, and have a career and not just end at the community college. Yeah, and advocate for things like you're doing so that we can continue that part of the, you know, evolution of not only women's sports and Title IX, but people that are being marginalized across the board. And that's, you know, societally, that's just as important, if not more important than anything in what you're teaching them is to stand up, even though it's hard, it's extremely difficult, it's painful, uh, it's gut-wrenching, but it's imperative for the for the greater good and that's what team sports is all about is the greater good yeah and you know the young ladies that my team this past season that were in the protest game um it took a lot of courage to do that and wear the shirt and orange coast college that played against us and supported and mm. we just came together at half court you know we're not enemies we're coming together for this cause but soon after and that's in the background my, there right yeah soon after my um student athletes started to feel what I felt and what they felt was they felt this tension from other coaches and tension from other departments. I'll just say that because we're still in this situation. And some of my girls said, coach, I don't know if I can do this. I just came here to play basketball and go to school. I said, you know what? I do not want you to feel what I've felt for all these years. Don't worry about it. I got you. You don't have to, you know, if you guys don't want to be on podcast, you guys don't want, we're just going to do our equality and women's page. 
We're going to do an awesome message this year. We're going to be wearing our shirts. We're going to do a Title IX tip-off in November. Um, mm -hmm. But you don't, you don't have to do anything that you're uncomfortable with because I don't want my student athletes to go through what I've been through yeah. um, because they experienced that with lifting weights and the guys coming and pulling weights right off the racks while they're lifting. And that's what really kind of started that whole situation. And so I told them, I said, I, I have you. And uh, we've experienced things August 22nd when we started practicing in our varsity class, we started experiencing things again. And so now it got them, it got them fired up. Coach, we got you, we got you, we, we get it now. <laughs> But this is crazy coach. And I'm like, yeah, I know it's crazy. Well, Gen Z is not playing either. So that's, yeah. that's the other part of it. They, they are not messing around with social media and speaking out. They will speak out about the right things. Well, well I a have a things. young lady that just like, coach, sign me up for every podcast. I don't care what, <laughs> what you're doing. Take me with you. And I said, okay, I'll take you with me. Yeah, she's amazing. Yeah. So they, 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 they are feeling it. They felt it. And it's just, I don't want their experience at RCC to be negative at all. So I shelter them the best way that I can. I um, take care of them the best way that I can. And our focus is to really have a great season this year. Mm -hmm. And so everything in my body and my mind is all about my team. And all about, really, all about the students at RCC. I've met so many great people after... <laughs> And again, that protest game came about and all of a sudden, before you know it, I'm signed up to be the co-equity chair for the whole college. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, like I didn't sign up for this. Like I didn't, you know, I didn't understand what I was really getting into, but now understanding the metrics that we're going over and working with the Dean of Equity um, and Inclusion. I mean, it's just like, wow, eye opening. Um, mm -hmm the marginalized women on our campus beyond our sports teams. So I am just like super excited to do that work. Amazing stuff. Well, shout out to your husband, your kids. I mean, your husband's had to endure this as well. Yeah. Like, man, <laughs> I can't imagine that. Like he is such a great source of support for you. Um, and, you know, shout out to the players, like you said, and, and you're a mom to them, not just to your own kids. They're like, you know, your kids and they always have been. And I've always seen how they responded to you. And, uh, you know, this thing will uh, finish the way that it's supposed to. And then hopefully it'll be behind you and there'll be changes in the areas that they should be. Not only there, but a precedence will be set in everywhere. community colleges and everywhere. So have a great practice today, Coach. We can't thank, thank you enough you. coming on the Sports Daily. We'll be in touch. And we want to get this word out uh, as many, you know, outlets as we can possibly with the media, social media. And so if you're listening to this and this is something that resonated with you, please, please don't be silent anymore. Be an ally. And it's not hard to be anti-racist. You just got to be conscious and deliberate every day. It's not hard. Share a post, like something, comment on something, share something. You don't have to be outspoken. You can duet a video. You can stitch a video. You can share something, but, but don't be silent anymore especially in this space with, uh, with women, Latino women, Latina women, and, and black women. So thanks coach. We can't, can't thank you enough for your courage, your grace, and the dignity that you've uh, approached all of this. Uh, shout out to your lawyer who's believed in you uh, from day one. Absolutely. And uh, you know, we're going to make this thing right. Right. Not anymore. Right. We're going to not put up with it anymore. That's right. Not anymore. That's right. the slogan. <laughs> and I got to get myself a shirt. I'm going to come watch you yes. guys play this year. I don't know if you're in San Diego at any tournaments, but. Um, Palomar you know, is close to you. Oh, oh yeah. We'll I'll be there Palomar. if I don't have a game that day, but maybe I'll, I'll get an assistant coach to coach my team. He'll probably play better. And then I'll come <laughs> watch you that day. That sounds good. <laughs> All right, coach. Much love, man. Right. And uh, glad we worked this out. And, Thank and you. Uh, we'll, we'll continue the conversation. Absolutely. Okay. Not anymore, ladies and gentlemen. Alicia All Berber, right. Riverside Community College, head women's basketball coach. Can't thank her enough for joining us here in the Sports Deli. Man, powerful stuff. Man, I, I would die to have uh, someone as my leader to be an assistant coach uh, for someone like that, which I've never had. Um, I've had some, you know, decent coaches that I've coached for. But can you imagine being an assistant coach uh, under her type of leadership? Man, or being married to her? What a lucky guy he is. 
uh, and those kids to be coached by her, uh, man, just unreal. So thanks for joining us today, everybody. Don't stay silent anymore. Much love. Boy, that was phenomenal. Great job and much love to everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us. Remember, Black Lives Matter. Stop the bullying. Stop the Asian hate. Contact your local and state politicians for any inequalities for any individual or any group that's being marginalized. Also, everyone, we want to raise awareness for those individuals that are currently imprisoned for nonviolent offenses in particular those with long-term sentences that are disproportionate in particular to those people in the black and brown community. And I want to send a shout out to 40tons.co. 40 Tons is a socially conscious cannabis brand and they're a social enterprise using the regulated cannabis industry to fight injustice in particular for cannabis prisoners. So check them out again at 40, the number four, the number zero, tons, plural, 40tons.co, because what they're doing in the cannabis space and being a socially conscious company is truly incredible, and uh, they have my full support. And also wanted to remind all of you, if you're having a tough time, you can always call the Suicide Prevention Lifeline, and that number is 800-273-8255. That's 800-273-8255. And now you can call 988. That's it. All you got to do is dial 988 from any phone. And they are available 24-7, 365 days. A year. And if you want to follow me on social media or Check out other episodes of this amazing Sports Deli podcast or any of my other podcasts. Go to my link tree at linktree backslash Mike Hootner. And if you'd like to support us at the Sports Deli, we'd love to have you either make a one-time donation or feel free to make a donation monthly, either $0.99 cents a month, $4.99 a month, or $9.99 a month. If you have uh, questions about that, Send me an email again to thesportsdeli at gmail.com and I will send you the link on how you can do that. Uh, you can also find it at the bottom of every podcast on Spotify or uh, Apple Podcasts. A link at the bottom to support the show. Please check, check out it. our website at thesportsdelipodcast.com. Make sure that we continue the conversations with regards to three strikes and you're out and mandatory minimums, especially people that are in jail for nonviolent offenses. So those things need to change. And remember, gents and ladies, please remember to do your monthly self-breast examinations. And remember, guys, this afflicts about 1,500 men annually with about a third of those resulting in death. So we want to make sure that we do our monthly self-breast examinations, both men and women. And guys, remember to do your self-testicular examinations every month as well. Until next time, remember it takes a village. I'm Hootie Hoot. This has been a production of Hootie Hoot Productions. Thank you for joining us in the Sports Deli, where everyone deserves a seat at the table. Remember it takes a village. Much love, everybody. Wow, if you actually stuck around this long, enjoy these outtakes, everyone. Elizabeth said she's going to come on for the first 15 minutes, and then uh, you said that uh, Cheryl will be on on. the 10 o'clock hour. So tell me what you mean about the name thing. Um, I don't know. Liz said come up with a name, I don't know, like champion of equity or something that. Oh, a phrase. Somebody like 
introduces me or something it's like the same thing on every media platform and I'm like I've even asked some friends I go what would they come up with slogans I'm like I don't know (laughs) I don't know what's the shirt say on the front and the back so it says equality in women's sports and then we have a trademark yeah and on the back I don't know if you can see it yeah we deserve to be here yep we deserve to be here so if you look on our our um that instagram yeah i went there yeah a couple times in their first video yeah yeah well we can think we can think of a moniker i'm gonna so i wanted to ask you a couple things i i didn't do the formal intro yet which i will i can i consulted a lawyer hey elizabeth good Good morning good morning hi we got any video with you elizabeth or what's going on with you say that again (laughs) you got video or only audio Oh, yeah, I got a bit. I didn't click on. Hold on. You got to hit start video. Come there on. we go. I just went straight. There we go. <laughs> Hi. Hi. There it Lisa. is. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. I have a, I, I have another. Well, I don't want to start talking. Are we recording? Are you recording? Who? No, I haven't done the formal intro yet, but okay. I, I can yeah, edit I have that to in jump later. Off at 12, so I wanted to make sure I got on. And I didn't realize that. I was thinking it's one Eastern and I was like, oh, darn, it's 12 my time. So. But I wanted to be on here to support Alicia. So go ahead and get started so I can. No, I'm going to do that part after because I want you to be able to um, share your thoughts about. Okay. From a historical perspective to, you know, why this is so important and why we're okay. going to be pushing this story nationally. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me turn this. On. I don't know about these Zoom backgrounds. It makes me look funny like I'm on a. Screen. I like I like the 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 team one that you had initially. That was... I know I'm trying I'm trying to find <laughs> I'm trying to learn how to, here we go. Yeah, I love that. And, and uh, I don't know if Judy Sweet's going to be able to make it. I've asked her to come on. She had an appointment, but um, if not, she certainly is behind this. She's um, the former uh, athletic director at UCSD and the first female president in the history of the NCAA, and she's been a huge. Uh, champion behind the scenes of title nine for a long time good to know i need i need to know all the people so yeah my because my lawsuit crosses over like employment slash title nine issues i cons- i consulted a lawyer to ask him to look through it to give me his opinion about what some of the bulleted items would be you know according to him because my lawsuit crosses over like employment slash title nine issues you know since that february protest game it really touched the title nine issues with my clients so right how they've been handling it